Alrighty, well, uh, good morning again. Welcome to True Grace Bible Ministry. My name is Mike Marcheski. Um, again, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And especially when it comes to uh, what we've been looking at last week about testament and covenant, okay? Um, is covenant and testament the same thing? No, they are not, okay? A covenant is an agreement between two people, okay? Uh, one, giving an example, will say, well, if you accomplish this, okay, then I will do this. So it involves two people. One making uh, the arrangement or agreement, okay, and then the other saying they will do it. And if the other does it, then what the one promises he will accomplish that through the covenant, okay? It's a, a contract, if you would, okay? Now, a testament is about one person. It is, and I, I, you know, going through this more and more this week, if we look at a, a will and testament of a person, their final will and testament, okay? A testament is how a person's will is carried out. It's their testimony about their will. And when we look at Scripture, testament is the same thing concerning God's will. And we're going to look at a few verses here um, about testament and New Testament. And we're going to see some things about an Old Testament and who they were to. Because nowhere do I find in the scriptures uh, stating that this new covenant is for the church, the body of Christ. Um, yes, Paul says we're able ministers of the New Testament, but hopefully by the end of the day we're going to see that testament and covenant are not the same thing. I think we did last week, but we're going to see more of what a testament is and what this New Testament is. And then what Paul means by we are able ministers of it. Okay, so again, a covenant is between two or more people, and it's an agreement. And that testament is of one person, how they're going to carry out their will or someone else's. And this is what we're going to look at in testament. Now, before we get into this, remember... The church, the body of Christ, was not conceived until Acts chapter 9 with um, Saul, who is now Paul, on the road to Damascus. Okay, he was converted. And then from then on, we see that God, Jesus, the risen Savior, has given Paul direct revelation for the church, the body of Christ. That didn't start till Acts, after Acts chapter 9. We have to remember that. And Romans 15, 8. Uh, turn there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So, Jesus' earthly ministry was to confirm these promises. And even now, as we turn to Matthew 26, Matthew 26, verse 26, when Jesus spoke these words, he was speaking them to the twelve, and they're referring to the promises God made unto the fathers concerning the old covenant, the old covenant. Testament, okay? So verse 26, As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, not covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you 
in my Father's kingdom. Okay? So, first of all, we see that in his Father's kingdom, that's when Jesus comes back for the second coming, okay? Let's put that in perspective. And then we talk about this New Testament. This is not New Covenant, okay? Um, again, I believe if God intended it to be about the covenant, he would put covenant here and not testament. Okay, they are not the same. They may be the same uh, as they um, interpret them in the Greek, but you know, I asked the question, and why? Why did the folks, when they put the King James Bible together, use different words? And you know, people said, well, I don't know. And my answer is, well, well, maybe they're different. So let's think about that, okay? But here we see that Jesus' blood, that some 2,000 years ago, was shed for the New Testament, okay? And what does that mean? Because how, how were folks saved in time past? It was always by the shedding of blood, wasn't it? Well, sure it was. And we're going to look at those things in Hebrews, okay? But now it's a new way. And we briefly read some of those passages last week uh, in Hebrews. But here his blood was shed for the New Testament. It's one individual. It's Jesus Christ. His blood was shed for the New Testament. And remember, when Jesus spoke these words, he was still speaking to the circumcision. And that's important to understand. Now, here's where the confusing part comes in. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll go right to verse 6. And Paul says, Who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter for but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. See, Paul says we're able ministers of the New Testament. He doesn't say we're under, even if this word testament and covenant were the same, he doesn't say that we are under any covenant. He says we're able to minister it. We should have an understanding of the work of the New Testament. Okay? We're able ministers. We are not under any covenant. Just as I you know, said when it speaks of the new covenant, uh, the scriptures say that this new covenant is with the house of Israel. I don't know why folks want to take that and take this verse and say, well, look, we're under the new covenant. That verse doesn't say that. This verse says we're able ministers of the New Testament. Okay. Now, let's take a look at something. If there's something new, that means there has to be something old, correct? That's the normal procedure. So we're here in 2 Corinthians. Jump down. Let's look at verse 13. And it goes on to say, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end that which is abolished. Talking about the law. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth. Paul's talking about unto this day. He's not talking about today. He's talking about when he wrote. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Let's read that. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. See, God's old will. And God's old will was through the law. Keep your finger here. We're coming right back. But Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness 
if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So if they would keep the law, God's righteousness would be put onto their account. And I just, people could just read what the scriptures say in Hebrews and to see that Hebrews is not written to us, it's written to us, but not about us, that all these things that happened in the Old Testament, that the blood of bulls and goats shall never take away sin. See, Old Testament folks had God's righteousness put onto their account. But it, it was a covering. And that's what we've read many times in Romans 4, when David speaks of Abraham, that his sins were covered. They were covered by what? The blood of animals. Okay, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So if there were no animal sacrifices, they wouldn't have remission. And this is what Paul is trying to speak to these folks. Because remember, when, when Paul's writing um, he's, these early epistles of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Galatians, the, the Jew were, they were in that transition stage as well. You have to remember this. Okay, because yes, we have the little flock. Okay, the Jerusalem church. But now there's something new starting. And this is what Paul is trying to tell them. Okay, we're, able, we're supposed to be able ministers now of this New Testament. Of this new way of God's righteousness. We want to look at it that way, okay? Um, <laughs> I say we're coming back to Corinthians, but before you go there, just look at Romans 3 for a second. To speak of this, you know, to show what I'm speaking of here. Uh, Romans 3 and 19, it says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, that saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may be guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, Paul's saying something different here now. Look at verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and available, okay, upon all them that believe. And that, that's what he's speaking of here now. God's righteousness is now available to everybody without the law. But in time past, his way, his testimony, the Old Testament, was through the law. But now, it's different. Okay? God's will, yes, I'm saying it, God's will has changed. God's will, his way of getting things accomplished, was through the law. And of course, they were a shadow of things to come, and that's what Hebrew tells us. And we know that it's through the blood of Christ, that Israel was redeemed, and it's through His blood that we're redeemed. But, we are not under this covenant. We are not the house of Israel. We have to, have to, have to get that across. So, let's go back to Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians. In verse 14, when Paul says, But their minds, meaning the children of Israel, were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. And you see how uh, Romans 3 coincides with that as well? That, that veil taken away, because now the righteousness of God is by the faith and the, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be getting into next week, is how we're able ministers. Alrighty? So, their minds were blinded. And then Paul says, even now when we read the law, the Old Testament, God's old will, it's, they're still blinded. And that goes all the way back to Isaiah chapter 6. And it's the same thing Paul says in Romans. So, let's go to Romans again, Romans 11 a few pages back in, in verse 5 
And we see how all this fits together in verse 5 when Paul says, Even so, at this present time, when he's writing, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, meaning the election, not their salvation, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel have not obtained which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. See, the little flock trusted their Messiah. Those ones uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry, possibly the 120, then the thousands on the day of Pentecost, and the ones that believed in uh, Acts chapter 11. Okay? They were added to the little flock. They believed, but the rest were blinded. And that's what Paul is speaking of in Corinthians when he says their minds were blinded about the reading of the Old Testament. Alrighty? And we're going to open up that more next week. And um, we're, we're going to go through 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll just see if we, I hate the word, use the word simply, okay? But if we look at Scripture and to see what Paul is saying and have an understanding of what was going on at the time when this was being written. And that words matter. That covenant and testament are not the same. Are they, are they closely linked together? Well, sure they are. Because without the New Testament, the New Covenant couldn't be fulfilled. Because the New Testament, the testator, the death of a testator, Jesus Christ, is how the New Covenant will be fulfilled. And so, yes, they're closely linked, without a doubt, but they are not the same thing. All right. Uh, even, let's go to Acts 28, and we'll, we'll, we'll just see how these things... Uh, come together of what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians. Um, Acts 28, verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed, after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, it's Isaiah, um, Isaiah the prophet unto our father, saying, Go unto his people and say, Hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, seeing you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understanding with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known unto you, therefore, unto that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. See, now when we read Second Corinthians again, Okay, let's go there. When we read 2 Corinthians 3 again, in verse 14, when he says, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away by the reading of the Old Testament, which is done away in Christ. Okay, see, that Old Testament, the way of righteousness through the law, is done away in Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 10, okay? Let's take a look at it quick. Romans 10. See, these are things I want to say for next week, but we'll look at them. And that way they'll be with us. Um, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Okay. See, this is where right division comes in. The, the blood that was shed for the New Testament is God's will. But when it happened at that time, it was for remission of sins for the nation of Israel. And that he would be a ransom for many, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. But now, but now, you see, the but now, this dispensation of grace. <laughs> but now, 1 Timothy chapter 2 tells us that he's a ransom for all to be testified in due time. See, things have changed. And over the past month or so, we've looked at the blinding of Israel in uh, Acts chapter 13. And God has set them aside and they diminished away. There's, um, there's a New Testament. 
And we have to be able ministers of that New Testament, of God's will. Okay? This is what Paul is meaning by that. I'm going to keep emphasizing it. Able ministers of the New Testament. Okay? And a testament is not enforced until the testator dies. This testament is all about Jesus Christ. He's the one that is accomplishing God's will by his testimony, his testament. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to us. We should be able ministers. All right? Uh, let's go all the way back to Hebrews. I know we were there last week, but we didn't uh, spend too much time there. Uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. And go right to verse 15. Verse 15 says, For this cause he, meaning the testator, Jesus Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Okay. See, the First Testament... The First Testament here, the transgressions of the First Testament, is what? It's, it's, it's the law, isn't it? Okay? And when I said that the Testament and Covenant are closely linked, it is so. Because remember, Testament has the, having to do with God's will and how He accomplished His will. Um, let's go, keep your finger here. <laughs> I know we're all over the place, but bear with me. Let's just go back to Jeremiah, okay? In 31, verse 31, of chapter 31. All right. Okay, you go back to Jeremiah 31. Remember what we just read here in Hebrews, okay? In Hebrews chapter 9, it says that um, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Okay? The First Testament. Now, in, in verse 31, we see that the days cometh, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We're back in Jeremiah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Okay? See, that's why I'm saying testament and covenant are closely linked, but they're not the same. Okay, God's will and his testament of how he accomplished things in the time past, the Old Testament as we call it, okay, was through the law. And it was given to them. Uh, well, these are things I didn't expect to do. Exodus 19. Okay, but I think it's, we need to clear these things up for folks that just, and to clarify for us that do understand it, to make it clear that Israel was given the law. We, the church, the body of Christ, were, were never put under the demands of the law. It was always for Israel. So, if we're not under the old covenant, how can we be under the new covenant? And how can we be transgressors of the Old Testament when the law was never put upon us? See, this is what I... I try to talk to people about, but they just don't want to grasp and understand, and they, they want to mix these verses together in Hebrews and Corinthians and say, well, look, see, we're under the New Covenant. It's to us. But it simply says the New Covenant is to the house of Israel. Gang, we are not the house of Israel. Okay? Um, forgive me if I sound frustrated, okay? But I guess I am, okay? Because it says very plainly, the new covenant is to the house of Israel. And now that Jesus' blood was shed for the New Testament, because the Old Testament says it right here. Okay, For he is the mediator of the New Testament that my means of death for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament. God's will. The law. Okay, Which were given to Israel. Uh, 
Exodus 19. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and indeed keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people of the earth, all the people for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid, therefore, laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Okay? See, the law was given to Israel. We weren't under the first covenant. We weren't under this first testament. Okay? But are we able ministers of this new testament? Oh, we sure are. Okay? And this is what we're trying to open up. Okay. Back to Hebrews. Okay? Let's come back to Hebrews. And we're going to go to chapter 9, and we just read verse 15, all right? Let's just read, okay, verse 16 now. It says, for where a testament is, there must also be of necessity the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead. Otherwise is it of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So that should be very simple, okay? Just when we write a will and testimony. If, if I write a will and leave everything to my kids, but I'm still alive, what do they get? Nothing, okay? Nothing. And this, is, this is, should be very simple language. Now, verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament, the first testament, was dedicated without blood. Remember, I'm, I'm trying to get the point across that we weren't under this first testament. It was all about Israel. It was all about Israel. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. See, folks, again, that first testament is to Israel. We have nothing to do with it. The book of Hebrews is writing to the Hebrews. Sorry. Okay. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things by the law, Purge with blood, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Again, remission and forgiveness, not the same thing. There was no covering. It was of necessity that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, better than the animal sacrifices. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. The blood of others. The blood of other animals. Okay. See, we're opening up what this New Testament is and how the Testament is accomplished. It's not by the blood of animals or any other sacrifice, but it's by the blood of Christ, isn't it? And this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get accomplished by writing to these folks who are uh, the little flock preparing to go through tribulation. And they know after Jacob's trouble that the second coming is going to come. And that there's going to be a better covenant put in force with better promises. Okay? Um, verse 25. Nor yet should he offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, there's a change, isn't there? No more animal sacrifices. But now, once in the end of the world, had he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. See, folks, that is in a nutshell, what this New Testament is all about. It's about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And it's the Old Testament. When we read up here, the redemption for the First Testament. 
and we come back with me a bit here, okay? Um, still in Hebrews. Now look at verse 12. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, talking to Israel, for if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. See, that was the Old Testament. God's will of how things were accomplished were by the sacrifice of animals. They were set apart. They were clean. They had God's righteousness put onto their account. But that was the Old Testament. The old way, if I may. But now, there's a change, okay? Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through, etern through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay? So, when Jesus said, at the we call the Last Supper, that he's giving this blood is for the New Testament, this is what he's talking about. Now, the writer of Hebrews is, is clarifying some things, okay? That, hey, the Old Testament of the animal sacrifices, the way God used to do things, it's changed. This is the New Testament. This is God's new will and testament. It's going to be through His Son, Jesus Christ. And you will have remission of sins until that new covenant comes into force. That's the house of Israel. Their sins, okay, their sins are still only covered through that testament, the, the shed blood of Christ, until the new covenant is fully enforced. And that's why I say the two of them are very closely linked together. Because without the shedding of blood and Jesus Christ, his new testament, the blood that's shed for the new testament, the new covenant, covenant excuse me, can't be fulfilled. Okay? All right, so we looked at Hebrews. Let's look at a couple more things here as we're in Hebrews as well. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verse 9. And this is where, hopefully, we can see that, you know, as a person writes their last will and testament, we can see that God's will and testament is accomplished through his son Jesus Christ. Verse 9. Because everything prior in verse 10 is all about the animal sacrifices and the keeping of the law. Uh, even verse 4 says it straight out. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats shall take away sin. Okay? They were covered. Their sins were never taken away. And that's why the new covenant has to come in force. And this is the, the shed blood of the New Testament. Okay, God's, God's new will. Did God's will change? I, I surely believe so. Because the old will, the Old Testament, was through the ceremonial and animal sacrifices. But the New Testament is strictly through the blood of Christ. Okay, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 10. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. For what? Once for all. See, this is what the New Testament is about now. In this new covenant, he's taken away the old covenant, the old promise, and he's making a new one. Okay? There's still stipulations under that new covenant, isn't there? Because if you don't believe, and, and for Israel, they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was their Messiah, would the new covenant come into force? No. And that's what happened in Acts chapter 3, when Peter offered them the kingdom. They refused it. That's why the new covenant was not fully enforced for them. Okay? But the testament of how the will is accomplished is through Christ right here. That we are all sanctified through the offering of His body, of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all. 
Let, let's read here. And every priest standeth daily, ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. See, their sins were just covered. They could never take them away. And this is why Jesus said, or God said, excuse me, in Jeremiah, he's got to make a new covenant. And that's what the writer of Hebrews speaks of in Hebrews chapter 8. It's the house of Israel. Because for us today, do we have to wait for any covenant? No. The moment you trust the gospel of your salvation, that Christ died for your sins, was buried according to the scriptures, and raised again the third day according to the scriptures, all your sins are forgiven. We don't have to wait for anything. It's a done deal. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse 13. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Boy, that sounds like what was going on back there in Acts chapter 2, doesn't it? When we, we see, we're going to go there in a minute, okay? But that's the same thing Peter was saying. So, well, let's just go there. Let's go to Acts 2. Let's go to Acts 2. And see what Peter's saying. Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 32. And let me read Hebrews again. Um, verse 12, I'm going to read Hebrews, but we're going to compare it with Acts chapter 2. For this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Okay? Um, and that's what Peter is saying back here in Acts. Excuse me, I got a little bit confused there on some verses. I've got ahead of myself. But here's what we're at, comparing to what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Okay, about his enemies being made his footstool. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32, it says, This Jesus has God raised up, whereupon we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but saith unto himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until... I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom we have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Okay. Now if we come back to Hebrews, and if we read verse 12, it says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. See, that's what was going on there back in Acts. That, yes, the Lord ascended, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father till his enemies be made his footstool. And then after the tribulation, his enemies, okay? Jacob's trouble. That's who he's writing to here. Then the Lord's going to return. Okay? But you see how the writer of Hebrews and... Um, what Luke writes here in Acts, they, they coincide with each other because they're talking about the same thing. Okay? Uh, and we know that in verse 30 that the Lord was risen to sit on the throne of David. So, this New Testament has to do with, yes, Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Okay? God's will is now being accomplished through that that lamb, okay, that was slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, as we say, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. But we, we still, I know people don't like this, but it is what it is. We have to rightly divide the word of truth. Because the day it happened, some 2,000 years ago, it was for the remission of sins. It was for the many. And he paid a ransom for many. But now, okay, but now... See, Paul being our apostle who didn't come on the scene until after Acts chapter 9, there's been a change that now Christ is a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And that, yes, that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. See, that's, as I said, we say, the plan of salvation. And when Paul says now in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, that we should be able ministers of this New Testament, it's the new way of God's will. 
we should be able to proclaim it, teach it, understand it in a way that people will trust it so they don't have to go back to that Old Testament and try and gain their salvation through the way it works. So, I know we went through a lot of things there, okay? But if I've confused you in any way, let me know. And if you have questions, let me know. But take time. Read Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10. And slowly you'll see that the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, hey, there's a better thing coming on and that the blood that was shed was for the New Testament, God's new way of accomplishing His will. And it was through Jesus Christ. And then, when we come in to Paul, he says we should be able ministers of what happened that day on the cross. By no means are we under any covenants. Lord, thank you. And I pray you make this message clear for folks to understand. And we thank you in Christ's name.